For a lot of artists, the hardest part about the job is pricing your work. Trying to figure out how much a piece should cost, whether it's a picture book, editorial illustration, or even a commission is just so complicated. You don't want to go too high and scare up a client, or unknowingly go too low and end up screwing yourself over. And if a client comes to you with their own quote, you might be afraid to accept it because you're worried that they're ripping you off. Pricing your work can be so stressful, but it doesn't have to be. If you're new to this channel, hi, hello. My name is Anusha Sayed, and I'm a freelance illustrator and character designer for animation. I've illustrated over 20 picture books and have worked with clients in the past, including Netflix, Disney, and Google. When I first started my career, I had no idea what to charge for my work, and I'd always dread hearing, what are your rates from a prospective client? I usually end up pulling a number out of thin air and hope it was okay. Or if a client came to me with a project and told me what their quote was, I just accept it. And I assumed that this is what illustration costs and not even realizing that I had the option to negotiate higher. Now that I look back at my first few projects, I realized that I had been severely undercharging myself. Unfortunately, this is pretty common because I feel like pricing is not really talked about in our industry or taught in schools. I've actually wanted to make this video for a while now and I hope that it might provide some insight for both new and more experienced artists. I've been freelancing full-time for about five, six years now and in that time, I've managed to pick up a thing or two on how to answer that super stressful question and I hope that this video might be helpful to you guys and give you the tools to be priced fairly. In today's video, I'm going to be going in-depth into how you as an artist should be pricing your work. I'm going to be talking about the difference between hourly rates and flat fees, how to calculate your rate, what factors determine your fee, I'll share a bunch of resources, do a Q&A, and so much more. Because I have so much information to cover and I think that it's all super important, this is going to be yet another very, very long video. So if you want to jump to a part that's more relevant to you, I included all the timestamps in the description box below, so you can just skip forward to the part that is good for you. Also, consider subscribing to my channel. I post tons of video on what it's like being a freelance illustrator, lots of guides, how-tos, and I have recently started posting chill studio blogs as well. Now that that's out of the way, let's go. Before we talk about pricing, I wanted to cover something that I think is really important. I feel like this point has been talked about to death and I might be saying something you already know, but should you ever work for free? No, 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 absolutely not, no. You should never work for free. You deserve to be paid. Maybe you're not raking in the big bucks at this point in your career, but you should at least be getting paid a living wage. Illustration is a valid career and is so important. Despite what some people might say, art is all around us in the media we consume, in every book, movie, advertisement, uh, infographic, website, like it's literally everywhere. It makes me so mad when I hear people argue that like if you're being paid for art, you're a sellout and you should be doing it for the passion or saying that it's so easy, I could do it too. But the fact is they can't, otherwise they wouldn't be contacting you in the first place. And you're not just being paid for the finished product, you're being paid for your skill, your time and experience. Like you wouldn't ask your plumber or accountant to work for free, an artist shouldn't have to either. I've seen this a lot with smaller clients, like, you know, regular people asking for a commission, but unfortunately I've seen big companies try to get away with it too. Some clients might insist that they don't have the budget to compensate you at this time, but this would be an amazing portfolio piece. It would look great on your resume or they would offer you exposure instead of payment, which is still just as bad. Even if it's for someone with 100,000 followers, exposure still doesn't pay the bills. And honestly, I've noticed that it still rarely translates into new clients because the right people are not seeing your work. Instead of working for a client for free, you can spend that same amount of time marketing yourself and creating new pieces for your portfolio of subject matter that you're actually passionate about. Similarly, in some projects, a client will propose a job to you, but will ask for spec work first, basically asking for a sample that will help them decide if you are the right fit for the job. You could create the sample, but still not be guaranteed the gig, and they would hire someone else, and while some clients will pay for spec works, unfortunately, some don't. It would be worth trying to negotiate for a sample fee, or you could offer a smaller size sample that would take you less time. But at the end of the day, you'll have to determine for yourself if you're excited enough about the project to risk not being paid if it doesn't go through. Also, I wanted to reaffirm why I'm making this video in the first place. Being an artist is a valid career and we deserve to be paid for the work and blah, 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 blah. But we also deserve to be paid 
fairly for the amount of work that we put in as well as our experience level. As freelancers, our jobs are unfortunately pretty isolated and it can be hard to connect with other artists for help and establish community, especially when we're starting out. And so we end up in a situation where lots of newer artists aren't aware of what standard illustration rates are like and clients will try to use that to their advantage because they're always going to try to pay you as little as they can. When I was starting out, if a client came to me saying that we want to hire you for X project and we'll pay you X amount, I'd accept it without questioning it because I assumed that this is what illustration costs when actually they were underpaying me and I had no idea. This is why I'm creating this video, to try to provide resources so that you are able to price yourself fairly. It is not only important for yourself, but for the industry as a whole. When you undercut yourself, you end up lowering rates for everyone. I know some creatives are afraid that if they are charging too high, a client might end up finding someone cheaper to do the job. If everyone has this mindset, we end up unconsciously contributing to a mindset in which companies will try to pay us less and less and less. Now, I don't want to blame artists who are undercharging themselves. I understand that this is a very tricky situation and you have to provide for yourself however you can. And at the end of the day, the actual problem is big companies who are trying to exploit artists. And I'll be honest, it's also the fault of experienced artists who are not actively trying to strive for wage transparency. Because I have the experience and I'm in a relative position of power, I want to use my influence to help new artists. And I hope that collectively we can raise rates for artists everywhere, especially those in marginalized communities and outside of first world countries. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about pricing. Terminology. In the illustration industry, you're either gonna be paid a flat fee or a rate. A rate is time-based pricing. Basically, that the price is determined by how much time you spend working on it. From what I've seen, the rate can either be an hourly rate or a day rate, depending on the client. This is a number that you quote at the start of the project, like say $65 per hour or $250 per day. And as you're working, you keep track of how many hours you spend working on the project, and at the end, you would send an invoice for the calculated amount. Sometimes you and the client might agree in advance how, that you would only work a certain number of hours to stay within the client's budget. Flat fee, on the other hand, is value-based pricing, which is based on the deliverables or the value that you provide to the client rather than the time. You determine this number based on the artwork's worth. And there are a lot of factors that go into this, like how many people are seeing this, who the client is, who owns the rights, and so on. This is going to be a payment that encompasses the entire project and would be a number that is agreed upon in the contracts before you start working. Like let's say in the contract, you agree upon $1,000 for a magazine cover. Sometimes the entire fee is paid to you at the very end, and sometimes it can be paid in installments. For example, 25% upon signing the contract, 25% on the sketches, and the other 50% on the final art delivery. If you're able to negotiate for installments, especially if it's a really long project, that works much better for you so you have some consistent income coming in to support you rather than like a huge lump all at the very end. Also in publishing, this flat fee is called an advance and royalties are separate from this. fee versus hourly. How do you decide which method is right for you? Now, in my experience, 99% of my illustration projects have been flat fee. I think this is usually the case for illustration gigs, but it might be different depending on the specific industry that you're working in. The flat fee allows you to be more specific to the circumstance because, as I mentioned already, a lot can determine what you're being paid, so the number might be different for every project. An hourly rate doesn't really account for those details since it's one number that fits a broad use. Personally, I prefer a flat fee. It's a lot easier for me to figure out from project to project, and as someone who is a very fast worker, I would actually end up getting paid less if I worked hourly because I'd complete the work in less time. It basically punishes me for being efficient. Flat fee can also be more appealing to the client. With a single number, they can determine whether your quote fits within their budget. On the other hand, with an hourly rate, you can also make sure you are being accurately paid for your time. Sometimes with flat fees, you don't account for exactly how long you're going to be working on the project for. You might agree to $1,000 for a magazine cover, but by the end of the project, somehow you ended up working on this cover so much longer than you intended either because you incorrectly estimated how long you would be working on it, or things like unexpected delays and revisions. With hourly, you don't have to worry about estimating the time you're going to spend working in advance. My freelance character design work is where I actually prefer to take on an hourly fee. This is mostly because there are so many revisions and waiting for feedback and meetings and research, where if I'm not charging for my time, I get pretty underpaid. Hourly rates are also 
pretty simple to calculate and are a nice fixed number for all of your projects. For my character design work, I'm pretty much always getting paid the exact same amount regardless of which animation studio I'm working with, so I can get away with having one number for my rate. I would say that hourly rates are better suited for ongoing clients or for projects that don't really have a predetermined end date, so you can be a bit more flexible with the price. And flat fees are better for a project where you know exactly what the timeline is and the needs are. Let's go over hourly rates first and how to calculate it and then we'll go on to flat fees later. Let's calculate your hourly and day rate. I want to preface this by saying that I'm not really sharing any new information on how to calculate a rate. There are a lot of rate calculators out there that can explain it so much better than I can. So you might find a better resource elsewhere, but I'm going to share this one which I thought made the most sense to me. I am heavily referencing an article by Xavier Colo Costoni, which I'll link to below. Please show them lots of love. They're on Twitter at XavierCK3D. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what you want your annual salary to be. What do you want to earn in a year as an illustrator? This should be a realistic number as well. Like as much as I'd love to be earning Beyonce figures, that's not gonna happen. I'm not gonna be aiming for a million dollars, but at the same time, I don't want to be underpaying myself either. This income is something that I need to be able to survive on. You might already have a number in mind, but if you don't, that's okay. The best thing is that you first need to keep in mind all of your household expenses. This includes things like your rent, utilities, healthcare, travel expenses, student loans, groceries, insurance, and so on. Write down all of these types of bills and recurring payments that you'd see in a year and then add them all up. Then you add on about 10 to 15% of that expenses number for safety payments. You know, things like unexpected bills or rent increases. If you have business expenses, add that number in as well. This includes any subscriptions like Photoshop, office supplies, studio space, art supplies, accounting fees, and your website. Because you have a life, you also want to think about your personal spending. Things like entertainment, clothing, and leisure. If you have an idea of how much you usually spend or budget yourself per year for personal spending, add that in. But if you don't know, you could add in another 25 to 40% instead. Finally, as a self-employed artist, you're going to end up losing a chunk of your income through taxes. To prepare for that, we're going to add on another 25 to 40%. This number is going to be different depending on where you live, so you'll have to research your local tax laws to determine what the specific percentage number is going to be for you. Okay, once you've added this all up, this number that you ended up with is your total expenses for the year. Let's say for this example, your number is $40,000. Obviously, this number is going to be different for everyone, especially if you are supporting family members, your local currency, or if you are living in a city with a high cost of living, so you do want to account for that. Okay, so this number could be your annual salary, but technically this is the minimum you need to earn in a year in order to just survive. From here, you can determine whether you want to increase this number to fit with what you think you should be earning in a year. Like ideally, I do want to save aside some money every year, so I might add another $500 for my savings. Finally, you should adjust your salary based on your skill and experience level. I wouldn't want to pay myself the same salary now that I would have earned when I first started this job. And so like after five years of working, I consider myself to be a more in-demand professional illustrator. So let's say I bump up my salary to $60,000 instead. Okay, we now have our annual salary. Let's figure out our rate. There are on average 261 working days in a year. Ideally, because we're not working robot machines, we do wanna subtract a few days for holidays, vacation, sick time, etc. because it's important to set aside some time for breaks. Let's say we decide to work 231 days in a year. Now we divide your annual salary by 231. This gives us our day rate. For our example, that's $60,000 divided by 231, which gives us $259.74. You could round it up to $260, but I feel like giving an exact number feels more professional to the client, like you really did the math, which you did. So if you wanna earn $60,000 per year, you need to charge a day rate of at least $259.74, and you can't go below that. And for our hourly rate, you just divide your day rate by eight. This gives me $32.5 per hour. Hooray, you have a rate. This number is the minimum I need to earn in order to reach my annual salary goals. But you can definitely increase this number depending on the circumstances. For example, when the client is asking for a rush job, their project might require you to complete it over the weekend, late into the night, 
or to prioritize it over your other projects to get it done within their deadline. You definitely need to increase your rate by 25 or 50 percent if the turnaround is urgent to make up for the stress and an inconvenience that it causes you. The faster they want it, the higher you charge. You can also price your revisions higher as well. This will discourage clients from taking advantage of you when asking for multiple needless needless revisions and changes to the illustrations and wasting your time. You could agree in the contracts that two rounds of revisions are included in your original rate, but additional rounds would be subject to the higher revision rate. You also have the asshole rate. I didn't really have a name for it before until I read it in Xavier's article. I just called it the fine, I'll do it rate. But basically, if you are ever contacted for a project that you really don't want to do, and you'd be fine if you didn't get the job. Like for example, the subject matter isn't interesting or the client is kind of a jerk, you charge a number that gets you really, really excited. This should be at least double your usual rate. So that if somehow the client does accept the rate and you have to do the project, at least you're getting paid well for a fine, I'll do it job. Finally, you might have to adjust your rate depending on how much work is coming in. The calculation assumes that you are going to be working eight hours a day for 231 days in a year. But as any freelancer knows, work is not always consistent. So if you feel like the number of paychecks that are coming in are kind of sporadic and you're not reaching your salary goals, it would be good to increase your rate to make up for it. Because my work is a bit more spaced out, I might decide to increase my rate to $55 per hour. Well, I hope this calculation was helpful. Like I said, there are quite a few rate finders out there. Some where the calculation is a bit more complicated, some that are a bit more easier. So you might find a better one out there. I just thought that this one was really cool. If you're bad with numbers, the great thing is that Alexandra Neonakis, who is a super cool artist, she created a spreadsheet that is based off of Xavier's article, which I'll link to below. It includes all the details that I literally just mentioned. And so if you input all of your expenses, it'll work its spreadsheet magic and churn out a rate for you. I probably should have mentioned the spreadsheet at the beginning, but Oh well. Anyway, now that we've got the hourly rate sorted, let's figure out your flat fee. Flat fees. As I mentioned, hourly rates are determined by how much time you spend on the work. It's pretty consistent from project to project. You'll always know that if you spend 20 hours on some illustration, you'll always be paid the same amount regardless of who the client is or what the subject matter is. So you could use the rate calculator we just talked about to figure out what your flat fee is. Theoretically, if you were contacted for a book cover and you estimate that it would take you 60 hours to complete it, you just multiply your rate by 60 and you have your flat fee. But when it comes to commercial illustration, this model ends up working against you. This is because a lot more factors come into play besides how much time you spend working on it. I have worked on a lot of books, but even for the same amount of work, I can be paid wildly different amounts from project to project. For example, let's say I work on two book covers for two completely different clients. It takes me the exact same amount of time to work on both of them. And if I use my hourly rate calculator, I could estimate that I should be paid at least $1,800. But publisher A offers me $2,000 and Publisher B offers me $5,000. Now, why is that? Is Publisher B overpaying me? Am I being cheated by Publisher A? Not at all. When you look into the factors that come into play. Here we compare the two clients and the details of the project. We find out that Publisher A is an indie publisher and they are printing 10,000 copies of the book and that they only want the US rights to the artwork. However, Publisher B is a major publisher with a larger budget. They're printing 100,000 copies and they want worldwide rights. Obviously, because Publisher B is going to be selling a lot more copies, they're going to be making more money than Publisher A, which means your artwork is bringing them more value and that you should be charging them more. This is why value-based pricing should be calculated differently for every client and is dependent on how it is used by the client and how much value it brings to them. Here are the pricing criteria you should consider when calculating your flat fee. The size of the client. Just as I said in the previous example, the size of the client is going to be the biggest factor. If you're doing a product illustration, for example, a giant supermarket chain is going to be able to pay you so much more than a small business owner selling jams at the farmer's market. 
client location. I'm based in Canada, but I've lived abroad for most of my life, and I know that budgets are going to change drastically depending on where the client is located. The pricing is going to vary based on the cost of living in the country, the value of the currency, and unfortunately, on how much value the culture of the country places on art. That last point is really sad and it's difficult to solve because it's kind of a cultural mindset. I remember being in high school in Pakistan and someone commissioned me for a hand-drawn portrait. It took me several weeks and I had to really, really convince them to pay me a thousand rupees for it. I thought it was a lot of money at the time, but I realize now that a thousand rupees is 10 US dollars, which is nothing for a hand-drawn pencil commission of like three characters done over several weeks. Like once you do the math of like how much time I spent on it, like $10 is nothing. Also, if I tried to charge my current picture book rates back home now, I would be laughed at for trying to charge that much for art. I think this cultural mindset issue can only really change if everyone collectively raises their prices and stands together for fair payment, but Obviously, this is easier said than done. Sorry for the tangent. The US in general has a bigger illustration budget than a lot of other countries do, both because of the value of the dollar, as well as the fact that a lot of major companies are based there and have that kind of budget available. This is why, even though I'm based in Canada, 99% of the work I take on is from US clients. US publishers have a larger budget than Canadian publishers, who have larger budgets than those who are based internationally. So if you are taking on work from a lot of international clients, you might have to manage your expectations. How many people are seeing it? The more people who are seeing your work, the more value it brings to the client. This could depend on how the illustration is being used. Is it a poster for a local band or is it for a national newspaper? More eyes means more payment. This also extends to geography. Creating an illustration for an ad shown worldwide is going to pay a lot more than an ad shown in one country. Size and location. Size and location also relates to how many people are going to see your work. Where the illustration is placed will change how much you should be charging for it. Obviously, the larger the artwork is, the more expensive it is, but it would also be more expensive on how prominent and visible the artwork is. For example, in editorial illustration, there are quite a few locations that the artwork can be placed. When you're thinking of a magazine, for example, from largest to smallest, you have the cover, and then inside you have two page spreads and then you have a full page, a half page, a quarter page, and then a spot. You could create the exact same image for all of these, like, you know, same amount of time, same amount of skill, technique, whatever, but each will cost you a different amount because of how much space it takes up and where it is located. Because the cover is the first thing that customers see and is kind of what convinces them to buy it, it brings the most value and would be priced the highest. Once you get into the magazine itself, spreads take up the most real estate, and then full page illustrations, and then half page, and so on. Distribution. Again, the more people who are going to see your work, the more it's gonna cost the client. How many copies of the picture book are being made? What is the circulation of the magazine? How many stores is your product going to be sold in? The more copies there are, the higher the cost. Rights. This can be a whole other topic, but basically, when you are creating an illustration for a client, you are not exactly selling the illustration itself, but you are selling the rights to use and reproduce the artwork. This is essentially what we've been talking about up until this point. You still own the rights to the artwork, but in the contract, you determine where and when the client can use the artwork how many copies, how many languages, how many countries, and so on. The more rights you allow the client, the higher the price. So let's say you illustrate a picture book and then afterwards the client asks for permission to create uh, bookmarks for marketing, for example, or the right to use the artwork for a paperback release. For each of these additional rights, you need to be compensated fairly for them. How long the client can use the artwork and how exclusive it is also determines the price. For a magazine, for example, they might only have the rights to the illustration for one printing and then you have the option to license that illustration out and resell it. But a picture book can have it for 10 years. The longer a client wants to hold the rights, the more you charge. And if they're asking for exclusive rights, that's potential licensing money that you're missing out on, so you better increase that fee. Of course, some clients will want to buy out and own 
all the rights to the artwork from you and pay you one fee to avoid paying for additional rights. This is called work for hire. And if a client owns all the rights to the artwork, they will be allowed to use it literally however they like. I've done a few picture books that were work for hire. And this means that they can alter the artwork without notifying me, create merchandise, adapt it into a movie, do literally whatever they want with it without paying me additionally for these new uses, involving me or even crediting me if they wanted to. You are essentially giving away all of your power to the client and this is something that you kind of want to avoid. Most illustration projects have pretty standard licensing periods. Like I think with editorial it's one year and for some other industries it might be different periods, I'm not sure. Generally there is no need for a client to have full rights to the work and you should try to negotiate away from it if you can. However, there are some instances where you just can't avoid it. For example, if you are working on a project that involves intellectual property or IP, it's going to be work for hire. That's just how it is. An example of intellectual property could be like if you were contacted to illustrate a picture book about Winnie the Pooh. I don't know. You don't own Winnie the Pooh, so you can't own the artwork either. If a client insists on buying out all the rights to the artwork, you better increase that fee by a lot to make up for it, at minimum by 100 or 200%. Workload. While we aren't entirely using the time-based pricing method for flat fees, time still plays a factor in how much you should be charging. A 32-page picture book is gonna take you a lot longer than a 12-page picture book. Full-color illustrations generally take more time than black and white illustrations and would be charged more. And we can always add in rush fees, if the client is asking for a fast turnaround. Okay, so clearly there are a ton of factors that determine what an illustration should cost. I've given you a ton of rules on how you can adjust your pricing based on you know, each situation, but I haven't really given you an actual number to start for your baseline. But not to worry, this is where we get into our next point. Pricing and researching your flat fees. So how do we figure out what an illustration should cost? Let's say a client comes to me asking me to illustrate their picture book. When a client approaches you for a project by email, snail mail, whatever, it will either go one of two ways. Either the client will let you know what their budget is beforehand, or they'll ask you for a quote. In editorial and in editorial illustration and in publishing, especially for larger companies, they will already have a quote in mind because they have a history of how much you know, they usually spend for projects like these. And in editorial, there are pretty standard rates across the board of how much spreads and covers cost. If they come to you with a flat fee already, you have a base number to start off with and you can determine whether this is a fair price or not and you can adjust it and negotiate using the factors that I mentioned before if you feel like it could be higher. But if they ask you for a quote, that is a little trickier. The first thing we need to do, regardless of whether they give us a quote or not, is to get more information. You never wanna give a quote or an estimate without knowing all the details. If they haven't given you a quote, see if you can find out what their budget is. Sometimes they'll share it and sometimes they'll insist on asking you for a quote because no one wants to set the price first and you know go too high. So we email back and ask for more details to help calculate our fee like what the workload is like, what their usage is, schedule, etc. So let's say that this is a mid-sized publisher based in the US. It's not one of the big five publishers, but it's, they still would have a decent budget. They're asking for a 32 page picture book illustrated in full color. They want worldwide rights, it's not work for hire, and they are asking for five months to complete this project. Oh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but if you have an agent, you don't have to worry about pricing at all because your agent will take care of it. They would come up with a fee based on their own insight in the industry or consider if the client's own budget is fair or not. They'd also help to negotiate the fee to be higher and more fair to the artist. They're pretty ruthless in that regard. They're pretty helpful. I know that this information doesn't help you if you don't have an agent, but I just wanted to share this option if you didn't know about it already. I have two videos talking about the world of agents if you are interested. You know, I talk about what they do, how to get one, and so on, and I'll link to them below. I have a literary agent, but as I've mentioned in the past, she only deals with publishing-related projects, everything else, editorial, games, whatever, I have to do on my own, so I'm not immune to still charging people. It sucks, but still gotta do it. Anyway, let's say you don't have an agent. After you find out these details, there are four steps we take to figure out our flat fee. Number one, hourly rate. 
I know I said that time-based pricing doesn't work well for commercial illustration because it doesn't account for the rights and the usages and whatnot, but we are still spending time on this picture book illustration project. And so finding out our calculated rate for this will give us at least a starting point for the minimum we need to charge. I could estimate how much time I would spend on this book and times it by my rate. Let's say I end up with $5,000. I now know that I should be earning at least this much if I want to reach my salary goals. Number two, past experiences. Pricing your work becomes more easier the more you do it and the more experience you have. As you get more projects under your belt, you'll have a better understanding of what the going rates are, but you'll also have a jumping off point. Look back at your previous projects. Maybe you haven't worked on a 32 page picture book before, but you have worked on a 10 page board book for $8,000. Using that information, we know that we should definitely be making more money for our new project because more pages, right? However, the board book that you worked on previously was for a much bigger, publisher than your new client. So the new fee that you're going to calculate is not going to be a huge increase from your past book because we are now dealing with a smaller budget this time. So we kind of have to keep in mind all of these little differences to come up with our new fee. It's a puzzle. If you don't have similar past project, that's okay. We now move on to step three. Number three, ask your colleagues. You might not have worked on a picture book project before, but maybe one of your friends or colleagues has, and you can use the steps above to see if they've done something similar. As I've mentioned before on my channel, I think it's really important to be part of the online art community and to make genuine friendships with your peers. Freelancing is pretty isolating, but networking can be kind of cool, but not in the sense of trying to use people in order to gain something, but actual real friendships and you can where you can help each other out and support each other. I don't have any co-workers but I'm really glad that I do have a network of artist friends. For example, I was recently approached for a board game project and I had literally no clue what to price for something like it. Thankfully, I had an acquaintance who worked on board games and I was able to get some information on what the industry standard for board games are like. I didn't get the <laughs> I didn't get the gig in the end though, but that's okay. I find that usually artists are very giving and willing to help others out. And I think it's important that we get rid of that mindset of like you're competing with all other artists, they're your enemy, it's you against them, when actually the mindset is that we should all be supporting each other and it's us against capitalism. Number four, research. Okay, hopefully you have some estimates already, but if you don't, we are gonna work a little bit harder and do some research. There are a few resources out there that include industry pricing for illustration. The most well-known is the Graphic Artist Grill, the, the Graphic Artists Guild Handbook, otherwise known as the Gag Guide. I've included a link to the book below, but you can also try to see if it's in your local library. This is an incredible resource and definitely worth the money. I feel like every artist should have this book in their collection. It includes sample contracts and forms, business and legal resources, and most importantly, a list of salary and rates for every kind of art-related job. They cover a lot of industries mostly related to the world of graphic design, but they also have a small section for illustration, which is super helpful. Within illustration, we have categories for editorial, books, fashion, packaging, medical, technical, greeting cards, and more. And they get really specific too, which I really admire. Like if you look into the section for art for retail, you have pricing for things like ap apparel, apparel? No, apparel, shoes, toys, and home goods. The pricing information in the book is collected through a survey that the guild does. So for each section, they're going to share a range of what the flat fees would look like for each of the categories from the lower end to the higher end based on the results that they collected. The pricing information in the book is collected through a survey that the guild does. So for each section, they are going to share a range of what the flat fees could look like for each category starting from the lower end to the higher end based on the results that they collected. The pricing chart might also include additional information related to royalties, licensing fees, and work for hire. So if I wanted to use this book, I'd search up picture books in the index and then see what the pricing chart tells me. Since my example is not a major publisher, but not an indie one either, and because of my experience level, I might pick a number that falls midway in the range that it tells me. I first saw this book when I was in art school, like seven years ago, and I actually don't own a copy right now, but I really want to, but I was waiting to buy the latest edition, and it looks like the newest one is coming out this year, so yay. 
I will note that I don't think you need to buy the latest edition. I don't know how big of a difference there is between the 2021 edition and the 2018. I assume that the rates might be more accurate to our time period and will probably account for emerging industries, especially because like we're seeing more and more um, industries related to like social media and stuff. The 2021 edition is $60, which is a lot of money. So I'm sure that the older versions will still serve its purposes. Um, just don't get like the 2007 edition because I think that would be a little bit outdated. I'll just add that this book would count as a business expense, so definitely write it off in your taxes. As great as the gag guide is, there are a few drawbacks to the book. The first is that all the rates on the book are standard professional rates, which of course is technically a good thing. Ideally, you do want to be charging fair rates for your illustration projects, but they don't really take into account smaller clients, especially the kind that you might be taking on early in your career, you know, the ones who might not have this kind of budget. The rates can also feel a bit vague at times. You might find that one of the category price ranges is like $200 to $20,000. It's just so non-specific that you don't know what to do with it and, and like which area section of the range you would land in. This book is also created by a US guild. So they surveyed American artists and the currency is in US dollars. As I mentioned, US rates are generally a lot higher than rates in the rest of the world. And so the pricing might feel a little too high for your country's standards. When I first read this book, when I was in college, when I was living in Europe, I could not believe these prices. Not only because of the currency difference, but also that I could not believe that an artist could be paid these prices. For example, the book mentions that illustrating a calendar for a client should cost between $6,000 to $12,000. At the time, I thought that was insane. Not because an illustrator doesn't deserve that kind of money, because <laughs> hell yeah, we do. But more that I couldn't believe that there were clients out there that were willing to pay these amounts to illustrators. Now that I read the book again, I do believe that these prices are totally fair and standard for the industry, but I think it does skew to those bigger clients found in the US. I think this is still a great resource, but you might need to adjust these prices to fit your client size and the country's currency, but at least you'll have a base number to go off of. Similar to the gag guide, we have a UK version, which is called the Association of Illustration. So the AOI is an organization dedicated to providing resources and information to illustrators. On their website, there are a lot of resources that are really helpful, covering topics like contracts, copyrights, self-promotion, and pricing. Some of these are free to view and others, including the pricing calculator, are included as part of their yearly membership. There are several levels for their membership, including students, professional illustrators, and then an option for portfolio promotion as well. While I personally don't have an AOI membership, I have heard good things about it and it could be worth looking into. While you don't have to be UK based to be a member and a lot of their information is universal, their pricing is based on UK standards and currency, which is probably more helpful for those of you across the pond. We also have lightbox.info. This is a newer website and definitely my favorite resource. Lightbox is a volunteer-led group dedicated to wage transparency. Also, they're 100% free, which is freaking awesome. They share a ton of resources and I also highly suggest you follow their Twitter page because they're always posting advice on there too. Anyway, their best and most famous resource is the Rate Finder on their website. The Rate Finder is a database of illustration pricing that real artists have submitted. Tons of professional artists have anonymously submitted their past projects, who they worked for, how much they were paid, if they were paid on time, and what the overall experience was like. I've submitted a few rates myself in the past. I find that this website is the most helpful out of all of the ones that I'm going to mention because of how detailed it is. The Rate Finder has a search bar, so I could search picture book and then be shown a list of all of their picture book rate submissions. I can see a full range of different pricings, going as low as $1,000 to as high as $50,000. I can try to see if there are any 32 page picture book submissions, and more importantly, I can try to see if there are any submissions from a specific publisher so I can find out what their usual rates are like. For example, if I was contacted by the New Yorker magazine for a spot illustration, 
I could search New Yorker and then see what people have been paid in the past by them. I find the rate finder to be super fascinating. You can see how pricing changes for each industry. Like with picture books, it's kind of all over the place, but with editorial, it's pretty standard rates across the board. Apart from US-based companies, they do have examples from international ones as well, which is super helpful, but I should note that they don't have that many at this point, but I do think that's gonna change over time. Because the database is dependent on submissions, the more people submit, the more useful the information is. So if you have past professional illustration experience, please consider submitting your rates. Another smaller pricing resource is Lisa Malfi's Guide to Pricing Illustration. Lisa is a UK-based illustrator and has a blog with illustrator resources and articles. She conducted a pricing survey in 2019 where 210 illustrators across the world submitted their rates. After creating the survey, she later created this guide, which includes information on how to price your work and rates collected from other artists. The guide is $5 and I'll include a link below. Okay, this is a much newer resource, but I think it's so important and much needed in our artist community. This is the Third Eye Collective, which is a Twitter page, but they also have a Discord. This collective was created to support third world artists in an industry that is heavily focused on North America and Europe. Global artists are routinely underpaid, both by their local markets, but also by Western companies that will try to take advantage of them by paying them less than first world artists. While their resources are open for everyone, regardless of where they're from, their server is specifically built for Latinos, Asians, Africans, and Pacific Islanders in mind, and to try to celebrate these places and peoples as much as possible. Their goal is not to ignore their global origins or to copy the first world, but to celebrate themselves with pride at the same time as being on level footing with the first world market. At the time of posting this video, the collective is still in its early stages, but their goals include creating a database of information, an FAQ, and a network of third world artists. Sorry, that's really hard to say. <laughs> Their Discord is also there to connect artists and to provide support and guidance, and I'll link both below. When I was preparing for this video, I asked my Instagram followers what questions they wanted me to answer, some of which I will get to at the end of this video in my Q&A. But a lot of people asked if I would talk about specific rates, like if I could share straight up numbers on what illustrations cost. As you have learned, it's really hard for me to share specific numbers because there are so many factors that can change it. I can tell you that picture books cost between $5,000 to $50,000, but that doesn't really help anyone because it's such a huge range based on a bunch of little details. And as much as I'd like to share what my past rates have been, unfortunately I can't, at least not publicly. That being said, wage transparency is still super, super important and it helps new artists understand what the going rates are, especially for artists of color. The reason I'm telling you this is that I do have one last resource. There was actually a hashtag that spread over Twitter, I think last year, which was hashtag what publishing paid me, which was started by a black young adult author called LL McKinney. The hashtag had writers and illustrators sharing what they were paid for the different books that they worked on. This was in response to the fact that people of color and other marginalized creators are largely underpaid and underrepresented in the publishing world compared to white and male creators. I'm going to link a related article below if you wanna learn some more information about the whole hashtag. Anyway, I participated in the hashtag and I shared all of my past advanced for my picture book projects, but eventually I did have to take it down because I didn't want my future clients to refer to that list I made when approaching me for future projects. I didn't want to end up in a situation where I give a client a quote and then they go, oh, but in your pricing list, you charge this much. My fees are gonna go up every year in relation to my experience level and I didn't want to be tied down to my publicly posted old rates. However, a lot of posts in the publishing paid me hashtag are still up and available. So if you are approached for a publishing project, you'll be able to see what other people have been paid before. Okay, so hopefully with all of this research, you have enough information to determine determine what your flat rate should be. Let's pretend that after doing all of this research, I've determined that a fair fee for my example 32 page picture book is $11,000. From here, you and the client can negotiate back and forth until you settle on a price that is fair to both of you. While we're on the subject of picture books, I want to very briefly talk about royalties. So in publishing, in some projects, the client will pay you royalties in addition to your advance. I'm not gonna talk about percentages because that's a whole other topic, but basically the way that it works is that once a book is released, 
you won't earn any royalties until your advance has been paid back. So let's say I have this picture book offer for $11,000 and I'm supposed to earn 5% in hardcover royalties. So I have to wait until I earn $11,000 in royalty payments first, which goes to the publisher, before I actually get paid my own royalties. Does that make sense? The publisher basically wants to earn back what they gave you for the project before you can earn royalties. So because this is a small percentage and a large advance, it can take a long time before you earn out your advance. In a majority of picture books, you never earn out. This is why you want to negotiate for a high of an advance as possible instead of relying on royalties. Secondly, okay, this is so predatory, but basically if a client ever comes to you with an offer where they say that they don't have the budget to pay you right now but they'll be able to pay you in so much royalty once the book or the app or whatever business becomes a success run away there's absolutely no guarantee that this project is going to make money or be a success so you might end up doing all that work for nothing always insist on upfront payment for a project no exceptions now let's take this into the real world with some examples Scenario 1. A publisher wants you to illustrate an educational textbook for $8,000. At first, this sounds like a great offer. $8,000, that is a lot of money. But remember, you never want to take on an offer without hearing more details. So on further questioning, you find out that they want 200 spot illustrations for the book in a lineless style that typically takes you a lot of time. And when you do the math, that ends up being $40 per illustration. If you spend five hours on each illustration, that's only $8 an hour. This offer doesn't make too much sense anymore and needs some negotiation. There are a few directions you can go from here. You could negotiate to increase the overall fee to reflect the workload or to reduce the number of illustrations or you could even ask if they'd be open to a more simple, easier style that would take less time per illustration to complete. Scenario two, a magazine is interested in a quarter page illustration due in a few days and they're asking you for a quote. Before this video, you might have been a bit stuck on how to answer this because they're asking you for a number, but let's use what we've learned so far. If we have the gag guide, we can quickly search to see what quarter page illustrations go for or you can search it up on lightbox.info. Searching it up, we can see that spot illustrations generally range from $250 to $500. If you are a newer, less experienced artist, you might prefer to skew on the lower end but keep in mind that they are asking for a fast turnaround. Considering that, we can email back saying that it's $500 to account for the rush deadline, but could negotiate to $250 if they are able to extend the deadline by a week. Scenario 3. A local small business owner is looking for an illustration for their website header. This is a much smaller client than the ones that we've mentioned previously and would have a smaller budget as well. You can actually choose to charge with your hourly rate here and calculate your fee based on how long you'd work on it. Even for a small job like this, it's important that you have a contract in place. Never work on a project without a contract and you want to clear up any details before you get to work. For example, would they plan to use that illustration for additional branding in the future, like for packaging or marketing? If so, the illustration is not providing more value to them and should be charged accordingly. And if they're looking to own the full rights to the artwork, remember to double or triple your calculated fee. I mentioned a lot of negotiation in my scenarios, and unfortunately, since my video is ridiculously long already, I can't cover negotiation today. But don't worry, it is going to be the subject of my next video, and so keep an eye out for it because negotiating with clients is a very, very important skill. We are almost at the end of the video. Thank you for staying with me this long. This last thing that I want to cover is a Q&A, basically answering any questions that didn't really fit in the previous categories. Let's go! When can you start pricing your art? If you are selling your work, you absolutely should have a price tag on it, like even from day one. Don't work for free, what I just tell you. But if you mean like, when do you feel like you're ready to start selling your artwork or looking for illustration work? I think it's when you reach a point where you are confident about your abilities and your portfolio and you want to take your first step into the career. It can be incredibly daunting and scary, I totally get it, but you can start by testing the waters a little bit and posting your work online and seeing if there's any interest or submitting to art directors. And if you aren't having any luck, it might be a sign that you need to work on your skills a little bit and update your portfolio or spending some time marketing yourself, but you can 
can always try again in a few months. I do talk about this in my getting started in the illustration video and I think my portfolio video as well. I'll link to both below. How do you figure out commission prices? So my video is mainly targeting commercial illustration, but we can definitely use what we learned for commissions. Since commissions are generally for personal use and you don't have to worry about the you know rights and usages, the using the hourly rate calculator would be your best way to figure out pricing. Multiply your rate by how much time it would take for you to complete a portrait, a full body illustration, or any other level you want to provide for your commissions. If you are worried that the final pricing is looking a little high and you feel like it would scare off customers, remember, art is a luxury, not a necessity. Your art has so much value and you deserve to be paid fairly for your work and the amount of time and love you've spent putting into it. In addition to your regular style and pricing, you could offer a cheaper option maybe done in a simpler style or in black and white, so that if someone really wanted to get a commission from you but couldn't afford the pricey ones, there is still an affordable option that is available that is still fair on you and your annual salary goals. So you should always charge in the client's currency and pricing standards, especially if the client standards are higher than your own. As I mentioned before, we unfortunately are seeing more and more first world companies try to scam third world artists and try to outsource design work, knowing that international artists are forced into the position to take on low paying work. In this scenario, the Pakistani artists would change their usual pricing according to what the US standard rates are like because they can afford it. It's totally fine to have different rates for different countries. Sometimes you'll have the reverse situation where the client's local standards are lower than your own countries. As a Western based artist, I am sometimes approached by international clients who will have smaller budgets than my usual US market. I am mindful of their budget, but at the same time, I don't want to lowball myself too much and straight away from my usual salary expectation. In this case, I'll try to see if I can negotiate for something that's in between their budget and mine, and if it's completely out of their budget, I'll have to decide for myself if it's a project that I really want to take on and forego my usual salary. How often should you go up in price? I think there are a few signs that show that you are outgrowing your current salary and could use a raise. One is supply and demand. If you find yourself being approached for a lot of projects to the point that you are getting overwhelmed or that you are rejecting them, it is a sign that you are in demand and that you need to increase your fee. Same for commissions. If you consistently sell out of commissions as soon as you open up slots or are getting a lot of tips, you are charging too low. When you raise your fees, you might end up losing some of your clients, but a number of them should still be interested in working with you and those are the clients you want to keep anyway. When I was starting out, I had a really big problem with saying no to projects and I was worried about missing out if I rejected something or I felt like I had to take these on. I also thought that if I took on fewer projects, I would also end up with a lower salary. But the mindset is that you want to prioritize quality over quantity. It's better to have a few projects that you are really passionate about and are paying you well, rather than a bunch of projects that are paying a little. It's better to do one thing for $100 than 10 things for $10 each. You'll reduce the amount of stress and overworking on your body, and when you charge higher with fewer clients, you might even find that you're earning more than you did before. The second sign is that when you're offering your initial quotes to clients, you notice that they all agree to your quotes very quickly. This might be a sign that you are undercharging what the client expected you to say and that you are giving them a great deal. Ideally, you kind of want the client to push back a little bit or try to negotiate. So if you feel like these quotes are being accepted very quickly, Maybe test the waters a bit and try increasing your rate for the next few projects. Finally, you might know it's time for a raise if you just get one. This is kind of what's been happening with me. I started my career charging a certain rate for my picture books, and then one day I got an offer that was a lot higher. I then kind of expected that to be my new salary and would negotiate any new books coming in to be closer to that high fee I got because I realized that there are people out there willing to pay me higher and that became my standard for a while. And then a year later, I got another offer that was considerably higher than my last one, and then that became my new standard, and so on. While I can't share what I earn as an illustrator, I think it would be safe for me to share this one at least, because I think there is a lesson to be learned here. My first picture book project that I ever got was in 2015, straight out of art school, and it was a six spread board book from a smaller publisher that specialized in kidlet. There were no royalties and this was a project that was sourced by my agency. They paid me $2,200 for it. I think this is a normal fee for this particular publisher, but it's definitely not industry standard and it's definitely on the much, much lower side for picture book rates. Since it was my first gig, I had no idea what was normal or not for illustration and I assumed that this was a good rate, especially since it was presented by my agency. 
they were wrong. Um, my agency was trash, by the way. I talk about it in my other videos. So the funny thing is, is that my very first illustration project ever, uh, which I did a few months before this book, was a book cover for a major publisher. I was paid two thousand two hundred and fifty for that. That price is on the lower range for book covers, but at least within the industry standards. I didn't make the connection back then, but I find it so funny that I was literally paid. $50 more for a book cover than I did for a whole picture book. Anyway, this is why wage transparency is important. I wish I knew what industry rates were like so I could have at least tried to negotiate that picture book offer. Okay, this video is turning movie length now. I think this might be the longest one I've ever done. So if you've made it to the end of this video, congrats! Thank you guys so much for watching the whole thing. I am super proud of you. I really hope that this video has been helpful for you guys. I want to stress that I don't have all the answers and I'm still learning. So if I'm wrong about anything, I super, super apologize. My next video, as I mentioned, is going to be about negotiating with clients. And so if you have any questions you'd like me to answer regarding that or just any questions in general, please let me know in the comments below and I'll try to get to that. I do try to answer all of the comments that I get. If you haven't already, please, please, please give this video a like and consider subscribing to my channel. These videos are a labor of love and I'm just trying to create educational content for illustrators and trying to make it as accessible as possible. So I always appreciate any support that comes my way. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok. I am at foxville underscore art. And if you want to see my portfolio, I'm anushasay.com and you can also find my online store there as well. I also want to note something kind of important. I know I encourage you guys to reach out and ask your colleagues for help with pricing, but I wanted to say that if you email me for pricing help, I likely won't be able to respond. I would love to help each and every one of you, but since my channel has been growing, I've been getting a lot of emails regarding industry advice and I do try to help whenever I can, but I just wanted to sadly say that because of the amount of emails that I'm getting and my busy schedule, I might not have time to respond. I wanted it to be clear that I'm not deliberately ignoring you, my schedule simply does not allow me to answer those kinds of emails anymore. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Check out all of the links that I mentioned below and also check out my other videos. I hope to have a new video out for you soon, but until then, stay frosty! Bye!